title of the message this morning, this Resurrection Sunday, is The Tomb is Empty, Jesus is Alive. The tomb is empty, Jesus is alive. Our text is Mark 16, verses 1 through 8. So I'm happy to see you all uh, as we gather today to celebrate what is the greatest day, what was the greatest day in history. The resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ from the dead. He's alive. Right now. He is alive. Our Savior is alive. He is ruling. He is reigning over his creation. Anything that happens for his glory is done by his grace and power. He is alive. So why do I say the greatest day in history? Thank you, Garrett. In 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul says this. Now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if, if, you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. So right away here, we see some things. It's the gospel preached that even allows him to call them brothers because the gospel was preached to them and they received it. They didn't just hear it. They didn't just say they believed it in their minds. They received it in their hearts. And they're standing in it. So present tense. And then this present future tense. They are continually being saved by it. The gospel. And then Paul tells us there's this other belief because he says, unless you believed in vain. So there's this belief that is empty and pointless, has no power. But then there's this belief that receives the gospel, loves Jesus because of the gospel, lives their lives because of the gospel, continually being saved by the gospel. Paul goes on. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. He received it from Jesus. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That he appeared to Cephas. Then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. Most of whom are still alive. Though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. Then all the apostles. And last of all, Paul says, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. So proof, witnesses, we've been talking about that. But I want you to see what he says a few verses later. There's a lot more in the chapter, as you heard, when Garrett read, but look at verse 14. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. No resurrection, no faith. Pointless faith. No resurrection, we're wasting our times. No resurrection, no salvation, no good news, no gospel, no resurrection. And not only are we not saved, we're wrong. We're lying about God. No resurrection, and we are the most pitiful people on the earth if there is no resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Verse 20, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. So here we are, not only Resurrection Sunday, but we are at the end of our time together in the book of Mark. God is good. We started going through Mark in Mark 1 uh, uh, and then through the whole book on Sundays with a few breaks in there, uh, September of 2019. And about a year and a half later, here we are. Let me remind you, we're going to set up. When, how, how are we at where we're at in verse, verses 1 through 8 of chapter 16? Let me set that up. And for those who have not been with us during this time, this is a way of setting our hearts so we're together when we get to the verses. Mark starts his gospel. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark, in his opening sentence, tells us what he believes about Jesus and who Jesus is. Do you see it there? 
Mark says, here's the good news of Jesus. Belongs to Jesus. It's about Jesus, and it belongs to Jesus. Here's the good news about Jesus. Of Jesus, Mark says. Jesus is the Christ, the Savior, the Messiah, and the very Son of God. After this first sentence, Mark writes the rest of his gospel to show this truth. That's the point of the rest of the book. This truth about Jesus. Mark shows us through Jesus' actions and words how Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God. Jesus comes on the scene, led by the arrival of John the Baptist. Jesus is baptized by John, and immediately we start to see these truths come out. Verse 10 and 11, and when he came up, Jesus was baptized, and he comes up out of the water, and it says immediately he saw the heavens being torn open, like we saw the curtain being torn. And what happens? The Spirit descends upon Jesus like a dove, and a voice comes from heaven saying, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. The Holy Spirit, the Father God, and the Son of God. The Spirit descends upon Jesus, and God the Father says of him, What Mark said in verse 1, you are my beloved son, Jesus, the son of God. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God, confirmed Jesus is the son of God. Jesus then chooses his followers. A crowd also begins to follow him, and out of that crowd he chooses 12. Jesus does many miracles seems almost everywhere he goes, he's doing miracles, delivering people from demons. He's healing people. A paralyzed man can walk after an encounter with Jesus. A blind man can see. A leper is cured. He's bringing hope. He's showing glimpses of the kingdom of God on this earth because he says the kingdom is at hand. He feeds thousands of people with a few fish and some loaves of bread. He calms storms with his words. His disciples now at this point are at the same time in fear and in awe. And they ask, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Jesus, the Son of God, is God the Son. His creation obeys him. Why do I say his creation? Isn't Jesus just a baby born in a manger? Paul tells us this about Jesus. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, or rulers, or authority. All things were created through him, Jesus, and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him, Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. By the way, he created the tree that made the cross. John tells us this. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him, not anything was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That's good news. But who is this word that was in the beginning? That was God in the beginning, like Genesis 1, beginning. Before anything was, he was. Who is this word of God that created all things? Verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth, Jesus. Before he created the universe, Jesus already was. Who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? 
That's who he is. The one who created and has all authority and holds all things together, including the molecules of the water that he commands. So we follow Jesus through the book of Mark. We notice some things. Everywhere we see Jesus go, he performs miracles. What's the point of those? To show he is who he says he is. So what else does he do everywhere he goes? He teaches and he preaches. The truth from the scriptures regarding himself and who his people are, what salvation and judgment are, and how we are then to live. His teachings are with an authority and a conviction that the people haven't heard before. Like his teaching that the kingdom of God is at hand because of his arrival. Jesus is the king. Jesus teaches that in this world, you are great if people serve you. But he flips this on its head and says that in the kingdom of God, you are great if you give your own life to serve others. Jesus teaches salvation can only come through him. So he is worthy for us to give our lives to. Because he also teaches that he came to give his life as a ransom for many. If you've turned from your sin, if you're following Jesus with your whole life this morning, you are one of those many that he came to give his life for. He gave his life for you by name, specifically. Because he loved you. We also saw something else about Jesus. He always spoke truth. Often, that meant speaking against false teaching and false doctrine and false religion. Jesus was often correcting false teaching, admonishing those who spoke false doctrine, and defending the truth against deception, corruption, and calling it out. Those who think they are with God because they call themselves God's people or say some words or do some act or go to the temple often, do some seemingly righteous act, Jesus spoke firmly against that. So we see early on, not everyone loves Jesus. Over time, many flee from Jesus and his teachings. Say his teachings are too hard. And many come to hate him. He draws big crowds, but often many are there for the wrong reason. To see miracles. To get something. And when he speaks truth, many fall away. He often speaks of and casts out demons. We see that the demons hate him. But we see something else. They're also fearful of him. He casts many demons out of people, and then he tells the demons what they can and cannot do. They hate his authority. They do not want to obey him, so they rebel and stir up trouble. And again, Jesus says that he came with a message, a message of the kingdom, to preach. He casts out many demons in one place and says, let us go to the next town. Why? That I might preach there also. For that is why he came out. A lot of people like the signs and wonders, but aren't taking his teaching seriously about who he is. They like his authority when it's over demons and sickness, but not his authority when it's over them. We see early and often false religious people and leaders do not like him at all for many reasons. They had taken God's truth and twisted it and added to it. They'd practice false religion. They were hypocrites. Using religion and, and gospel for gain. Holding others to their man-made rules while disobeying the very commands of Scripture themselves. They were more focused on this life than eternal life. More focused on their own earthly power and glory than God's power and glory. Once when Jesus heals someone, Jesus claims to do something that only God can do. He says he can forgive sin. Now they want him dead. Therefore, Jesus spends his time with sinners and tax collectors. They don't like this either. But why is he with them? For the very reason he says that only those who know they are sick in sin can know that they need a Savior from it. 
Jesus shows them and tells them the gospel. He calls them to repent and follow him. He forgives their sin and tells them to go and sin no more. The religious leaders get even more angry. Now, Jesus continually calls out their false religion, even sometimes in parables. Calls out their hypocrisy. They're made up, going through the motions, lukewarmness towards God. About halfway through Mark, one of his disciples, Peter confesses what Mark had said in verse 1. That Jesus is in fact the Christ, the Messiah. But many expected the Messiah was going to be a political, military king. To take over physical Israel. To overthrow the Romans and deliver Israel from Roman oppression. They miss the fact that for Jesus to be the Messiah means that he's coming in the form of a suffering servant, as we read in Isaiah 53. A king, but a king who will bring God's rule by giving up his life for his people. As the one and final perfect sacrificial lamb who will die once and for all for the sins of all those who trust in him. Jesus tells them three times, as for an example, Mark 8, 31, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Right after saying that, he tells them what that means for them and for us. Verse 34, in calling to the crowd with his disciples, he said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. And take up his cross and follow me. Following Jesus was not going to lead to fame or power or comfort or earthly prosperity or status or money. Jesus makes it clear that following him is actually more like dying. Dying to self and this world. It means carrying our own cross, rejecting sin and pride and selfishness, rejecting the desire to be the ruler over our own life or indulge in the ways of the world. So in chapter 10, Jesus tells his followers, I did not come to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. Jesus is trying to prepare them and us for a full understanding of the gospel, what the Messiah must do, and how we then will react. So Jesus repeatedly says that he will suffer, that they will suffer many things, and that he will die, and he will rise again. Then we get to Holy Week. Jesus goes into Jerusalem with his followers. He brings a huge crowd. But many are there because he had just raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus, in what is commonly called his triumphal entry, enters Jerusalem in Mark 11 to a crowd. And the crowd is yelling, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessing is the coming kingdom of David. Hosanna in the highest. Many are seemingly worshiping him. But many, it is later revealed for the wrong reason. And in this crowd, there are those false religious leaders who want him dead. So Jesus, who knows what's in the hearts of all men, immediately begins to speak judgment over the city And the people, especially the religious leaders. He curses the fig tree. He cleanses the temple. He flips over tables. He knocks over their seats. And as always, he's teaching. Mark 11, 17, he was teaching. Is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. The religious leaders begin to boldly challenge Jesus now. They challenge what he's teaching, what he's preaching, especially in regards to the authority by which, by which he speaks. Mark eleven twenty eight. By what authority are you doing these things? They say, who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus, instead of directly answering their question, points out their evil hearts and their hypocrisy. He asks them about John the Baptist. Now they're trapped. They refuse to answer. So Jesus refuses to answer them. He tells some parables about the false religious leaders. In summary, saying that their rejection of him will lead to their destruction. They will lose the kingdom of God that they are falsely assuming is their kingdom. 
They want to arrest him. But they're worried if they do, the crowd will turn on them. So they try to trap him. Three times they try to get him to say something that will get him arrested and killed. They want the crowd to turn on him and the Romans to kill him. Jesus instead turns their traps against them. He is the logic and wisdom of God. Jesus shows that he is who he is, the Messiah, the Son of God, meaning Jesus is God the Son, the I Am, the Lord. Now they no longer dare to ask him those type of questions in public, so they turn to deception and betrayal. Jesus tells the coming of judgment upon the Jews, the temple, unless they repent and turn away from their sin and put their faith in him to save. He prophetically tells of the destruction of the very temple itself. At the end of that, Jesus says to his followers, Mark 13, 13, you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. After that, the false religious leaders are in an all-out plot to kill Jesus as soon as possible. They hate him. They want him dead but it's Passover week. Jesus brings his disciples for the Passover meal, the giving of the Last Supper, the bread and the cup, the bread, his body, the wine, his blood. And then Judas is revealed. Jesus prays. The disciples sleep. Jesus is alone. Betrayed by Judas, arrested, brought to trial, first before the Sanhedrin, then the Romans. Peter denies Jesus three times, refusing to deny Jesus himself. The disciples scatter. The week that started with a crowd yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna, ends with a crowd yelling, crucify him, crucify him. Jesus is mocked, spit on, whipped to near death, put on a cross, and Jesus Christ, the Son of God, dies still showing his power and glory. As as he's about to take his last breath, Jesus cries out, It is finished. So the mighty Son of God, the soon returning warrior king, dies on a cross. And he's buried, which we talked about last week. Many witnesses see proof Jesus is dead in the tomb of a rich man. As the prophets had said, covered by a huge rock in this tomb, guarded by Roman soldiers. Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, Jesus, the Savior, the Lamb of God, is dead. His body in a tomb. Open to Mark 16, verses 1 through 8. It's now Sunday morning. He's been dead since Friday. Saturday was the Sabbath. Verse 1, When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they might go in and anoint him. Very early the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll the stone away for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples, and Peter, that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. God's word to us this morning. So Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, God the Son, died, and now today we have an empty tomb. Let us ask, why did Jesus die? For the sins of many, we're told. Jesus died then for sin. Not his sin, 
But if you are a follower of Jesus, or if even today you repent and put your faith in Jesus, He died for your sin to pay the penalty you deserved. We all deserve death and separation from God forever. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've already seen He created the universe and all that is in it. He created you. Genesis 1.27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female, he created them. God created you and I to bear his image, to be like mirrors who live our lives to tell a truth about God and who he is, that we would live in a way that shows the world the worth of God, the awesomeness of God for the glory of God. God is holy. God is set apart from his creation. He is far above the heavens. He is perfect. God is always right. His ways are always better. God does whatever he pleases. So after creating us to bear his image, the Bible says that God was well pleased. So, as image bearers, we are to be well pleased with God. To joyfully submit to all of his authority. To trust what he says is good and right and how we should live. And to do so is to worship him. But there's a problem. A really big problem. Sin. Again, Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin is to turn away from God and his ways. To do things our way. To make excuses as to why our way is better. To not trust his commands and his ways. To trust our ways over God's. To give ourselves authority over our own lives, stripping God of his authority over us. Missing the fact that his ways are loving and good and guiding us to him and his glory. But it's worse than that. It's deeper than that. Sin is to go to other things for what only God can provide. Life, breath, everything, joy, peace, comfort, eternal life. God is the ultimate source of all good things. And we turn to other things to be satisfied. That not only fails us, it is sin. Sin is rebellion and seen in re- as rebellion in our actions, but starts in our hearts. Desire. Sin is to turn away from a holy God, an eternal God. So what? Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. Our sin needs to be punished. The punishment is death. What is death? Death is separation. Separation of our spirit from our body and separation of us from God forever. It's what we deserve because God is just. God is fair and therefore we deserve hell. Sin against a holy and infinite God deserves ultimate and eternal punishment. Permanent separation from God. That's what we all deserve. That's the gospel. At least the beginning of it. Revelation 14, 6 and 7, John says, I saw an angel flying directly overhead. What is the angel going to say? An eternal gospel to proclaim. The eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. And he said with a loud voice, what is this eternal gospel? Fear God. Give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. We are all worshipers. We spend our lives worshiping. What or who do you worship? We all have not. We all have not lived in a way or worshiped God in this way. And sin needs to be punished by a just God and the punishment needs to be eternal and infinite because God is. Therein lies a problem. None of us are eternal or infinite. None of us are holy. We don't have enough in our account to pay the penalty. 
We never will. And there's nothing we can do to earn our salvation. Nothing. So now what? Coming into Mark 16, Jesus is dead. Why did Jesus die? To give his life as a ransom for many. Why can Jesus be the one to pay the price? First, who is Jesus? Is Jesus holy? Yes. Jesus is perfect. The fullness, 100% of God. He is man. He was born of a woman. Jesus was born of Mary. Jesus never sinned. This man, Jesus, is perfect. So a perfect man, he might be able to pay for our sin. He might be the Savior. But is Jesus also eternal? That man, Jesus, has proven to be God the Son, the I Am, the Lord of Lords. So there's only one way for anyone who has ever lived to be saved from their sin, reconciled to God, live forever. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus must pay for your sin. You can't. But to do that, he must die, which he did, on the cross. Jesus, all man, yet perfect. Jesus, all God, so eternal. The perfect and infinite one must die to pay for the sin you committed to be saved, for you to be saved. And not just die, remember what Paul had told us. If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain, your faith is in vain. So the question before us today, the only question left as we finish Mark, has Jesus been raised? Or is he still in the tomb? Or still on the cross? So in our text, we have these women. We've seen them before. They were at the death of Jesus. They were witnesses to the death of Jesus. But we're told they're watching from a distance. Then at least two of them are witnesses to his burial. We saw that last week. And now Sunday morning. Verses 1 through 3, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early, the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went into the tomb. They were saying to one another, who will roll the stone away for us from the entrance to the tomb? These women are making their way to the tomb. They're sad. They might be scared. What are they expecting when they get there? A dead body. They're bringing spices to anoint him. But then it occurs to them, "Uh uh-oh, what about the stone? They're not expecting a resurrection. Verse 4. Looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. Well, one problem has now been solved. The stone is rolled back. So they think they can go in and anoint the body of Jesus. Verse 5, they enter the tomb. They see a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. They go in and see what appears to be a young man dressed in white. They're scared. Understandably so. So they go from despair to shock. First, the tomb is open. The stone has been rolled away already. There's someone in the tomb. And that someone speaks to them. What he says to them will be the focus of the rest of the sermon. Verses 6 and 7. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell the disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. But before we look at what the angel says to this, these women, I want to show you why I'm saying an angel. Because in Mark it says a young man. Look at Matthew's account. 
Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So now we know who moved the stone. Angel of the Lord. Now we know why the guards don't do anything about these women being there. They fell over and fainted in fear. And we know that this one who appears in Mark like a young man in white is an angel. Let's look at what he says to these women and importantly what it says to us today. Seven messages from the angel in the empty tomb. The angel says this, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who is crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Number one, do not be afraid. The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive, so do not be afraid. This is a common first line when an angel speaks to someone. It's also one of the most common commands of Jesus to his followers. Do not be afraid. Do not live in fear. We see here in Mark, after talking to the angels, these women do freeze up for a moment in fear. But Matthew tells us they will then run and tell the disciples in excitement. Along the way, something interesting happens that Mark doesn't tell us. Jesus meets up with them. Do you know what the risen Jesus tells them? Matthew 28, 10. Do not be afraid, Jesus said to them. Do not be afraid. Go tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Church, to us, to you, the tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. In this world, we will have tribulation. It is promised. Jesus tells us. He is alive. Do not be afraid. Do not live in fear. Jesus is alive. Number two. They seek Jesus who died on the cross. The angel says, you seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. So first, this would have shocked the women even further. Not only is the stone rolled away, the guards are probably still laying on the ground. Jesus' body is gone. There's this angel that looks like a man dressed in white in the tomb. And now the angel knows why they're there. He knows their thoughts. He knows their intentions. Because the angel had been sent with a message. Do not be afraid. Why? Because of their intention in their heart is to seek Jesus church, this should be our life intention. You want to be no, have no fear? You want to not be afraid? Seek Jesus who was crucified. They're seeking after Jesus and because the tomb is empty that may cause them fear but because Jesus who was crucified has an empty tomb and is alive they should have no fear. Number three, why? He is risen. The angel says it. He has risen. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He did it. This is the good news of the good news. We all need a Savior who would die on a cross for us, or we are without hope. But if he has not been risen, we are still without hope. But he has. Jesus did it. Victory has come. He is risen risen. We all need a Lord and God who can overcome death and give us eternal life. 
the best news ever is true news. It's a fact. The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. Have no fear. Seek Jesus. Repent and believe in Jesus. He is risen. Next, the angel points to the place he was laying and says, he's not here. See the place where they laid him. Number four, he's not in the tomb. So Jesus is risen, but he's not in the tomb. Again, these women are mentioned as witnesses. The angel says, look. Before we, we saw they were seeing him on the cross. They saw where he was buried. Now the angel says, look. He's not here. This is awesome, but probably also shocking. This is further proof to us that Jesus rose again. Not only because of all the eyewitnesses, and there were many, but even more important, because of the radical life change of those who saw Jesus after his resurrection. What do I mean by that? The angel tells them what the resurrection means for them, what the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead means for us. What shall we then do if we truly believe that Jesus is alive right now? Number five. Go. Now go. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go. Now go. Often, after one sees an angel or sees the glory of the Lord or spends any time with Jesus, the very next command is often, go. But go where? To do what? Tell. The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. He is risen. So go and tell. They are to tell first the disciples and Peter. I've said this before, but the fact that Peter is mentioned, do you hear Jesus through this angel telling the women to give the disciples a message of forgiveness, reconciliation, and love? Go tell the disciples first and Peter. Make sure you tell Peter. Why? The disciples had not lived up to their promises. You're supposed to listen to the rest. That's the point of that. The disciples had not lived up to their promises. They'd made promises to Jesus, especially Peter. And where are they now? They're hiding. They're scared. They're scattered. They are afraid. And the angel says to these women, the tomb is empty. Jesus is risen. He is alive. Go and tell. Church, what a calling this is to us. Many in our day are living their daily lives in fear. At this point, the news, no matter what channel you watch, is often trying to keep us in fear. Or at least distracted by all the confusion and conspiracy. Distraction, fear, conspiracy, confusion, that's many people's daily existence. The fear of viral spread of a sickness. The fear of the viral spread of wokeism. The fear of being canceled. The fear of missing out. The fear of the world hating us. The fear of persecution. The fear of people different than us. The fear of being different from people. The fear of oppression. The fear of oppressors. The fear of racism. The fear of being called out for believing that the Bible is true. The fear of death. The devil has used many deceptions in our day to spread a viral sickness called fear and confusion. And with it goes sin spreading across our land. And we know something the tomb is empty, Jesus is alive. So go and tell. 
What did the angels tell? What did the angel tell them to tell the disciples? Jesus will be with you. You will see him again, just like he said. There you will see him, just as he told you. He's going before you to Galilee. What a hope-filled message. What a promise to them and to us. The tomb is empty. Jesus is risen. He will go before you. He has gone before us. You will see him again, face to face, just like he promised. We can also be sure that when we follow Jesus and tell people about Jesus, he will lead us. He goes before us. He is with us. No matter what happens to us, if we persist in our faith, we will one day see him again, face to face as our Savior and Lord and King. This promise to them is a promise to us because he has promised that to us. He has gone before us. He is preparing a place for us. And now here we are at the end of Mark with an empty tomb, a risen Savior, our Lord and God, Jesus Christ, is risen. He is alive. So these women are to go and tell the disciples. I said something before about the truth of Christianity. One of the most shocking evidences for the truth of Christianity is the reaction of the disciples and the result of their reaction to the good, good news that Jesus is alive. Well, how do they react? Well, we know. Before hearing this news, some are hiding in fear. Some of his followers are leaving Jerusalem to get away in despair. They aren't bold. They aren't speaking his message. These men who are given the very message from these women are powerless. They're poor. They're uneducated. They are not social influencers by any standard. They're super scared. They don't want to happen to them what has happened to Jesus until they find out that the stone is rolled away. Have you ever thought about why the stone is rolled away? Jesus in his glorified and resurrected body at the end of the book of John shows up in a room with the disciples even though the doors are locked. Jesus wasn't constrained by doors or stones. The stone was rolled away so that the women could go and tell. More evidence. More witnesses. Go tell the disciples that they could even see with their own eyes the proof of the resurrection so they could go be as witnesses to a dying world. They heard. They saw. The stone was rolled away. The tomb was empty. And that's not all they saw. They saw Jesus himself, his resurrected body. Again, 1 Corinthians 15. He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, to James, to the apostles, and last of all, to Paul. There are many witnesses, many who heard that he was alive, many who saw him after his resurrection. Jesus is alive. But the miracle is what happens next. The disciples who are hiding in fear while Jesus is in the tomb. Some of Jesus' own family, including his brother James, have doubts about him until the resurrection. Until the tomb is empty. Until they say Jesus, see Jesus alive. That truth radically, radically changes all who truly believe it. Let me say that again. Jesus is alive. That truth radically changes all who truly believe it. So Jesus appears to them, and these with no worldly power, 
are given a mission from Jesus. Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Sounds like the message from the angel. Go, tell, or go before you. I am with you. How will they make this happen? They were hiding. They were scared. They have no power. Spread the gospel to the ends of the earth? Well, they're given the Holy Spirit for this reason. For this very reason, Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Why? Why the power of the Holy Spirit? You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the of the earth, which includes western Wisconsin. So what do these formerly fearful fishermen, these tax collectors and sinners, most of them fairly young, some former Jewish leaders, and one former murderer of Christians, Paul, what do they do? What happens to them after they see that the tomb is empty and Jesus is alive? They radically change the world. That truth changes radically every part of their lives. They follow after him. They seek him daily. They deny themselves and take up their crosses and follow Jesus. Most of the disciples and many other others after them, and many this day go to their death because they know Jesus is alive. They know, in fact, Jesus has died for their sins and saved them from hell. They know, in fact, Jesus has raised from the dead, and in fact, one day he will return for all those who repent and believe in him. And because they believe that, they're willing to give up everything, including their very lives, because of their faith in the resurrected king and the coming kingdom of God. Jesus Christ is alive. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. If you have not repented of your sin, if you have not put your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or if you've fallen away, or for any reason your heart is saying right now, I need Jesus. It's probably why you're hearing this today. You need to. You need to trust in Jesus. Tell someone today. Tell the person that brought you, come and talk to me. Repent and believe. Jesus is the only way. For those who have repented of their sin, who have put their faith in the risen King, Jesus Christ our Lord. Because Jesus rose again, your hope and your future are safe and secure in his hands. You can trust him. You should obey all that he commanded. Because Jesus is the path to life, the fullness of joy and pleasure forevermore. Jesus died for our sins. He was raised up for our justification so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. The resurrection of Jesus Christ says something to you today. If you love him, your eternity is secure. You are going to live forever in unspeakable joy with God. You will see him again face to face. Church, we need to be happy about that. Submit to the good King Jesus and then something else. Go and tell. Jesus is alive. The last chapter of the Bible tells us this same promise that the angel gave to the women at the tomb. The Bible ends this way. Jesus here testifies once more. Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we are unworthy to 
to understand your word, to be given your very word unto us for salvation. We know we have all fallen short. We thank you. May we joyfully worship you. May we fearlessly go and tell that you are alive. We need your spirit to do that, so we ask for it like you tell us to. I pray for any here who are not following you or have fallen away that you would open their eyes, remove their blindness, soften their heart, and that they would be bold enough to tell someone that we would stand with them as a church, that we would pray with them. For any here who are following you but have doubts about their eternal salvation, Remind them with your promises that you are with us. You are going nowhere. We will see you face to face. No one can snatch us out of your hand. Jesus, as you promised, we know you're coming soon. Help that promise to fuel our desire to love you more and speak of you often with no fear. Amen. Let's, pr- let's sing.